Hello there, everybody. It's me, Gary Kidney, the co-host of You've Got to Be Kidding Me on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. And I am Liam Jones, my full name, and I am also a part of the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network as a co-host for You've Got to Be Kidding Me. We are a TNA history podcast that covers TNA one month at a time. We cover all the drama, all the matches, all the Vince Russo nonsense you could ever want in your life. Have you you heard of TNA? I bet you have. But would it be funnier if two people made jokes over it the whole time? Probably. So if that sounds like fun to you, check it out on this very Voices of Wrestling podcasting network, and Liam will do bits and whatnot. Do you like wrestling trivia? Then check out the five-star match game, the Pro Wrestling Quiz Show. I'm Joe Gagne, and every episode, I grill three contestants with five rounds of power-packed wrestling trivia. We have over 30 evergreen episodes in the archives covering WWE, AEW, Japan, Mexico, and much, 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 much more. Play along at home and check it out today. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. To the highway, in a brand new day, gotta let it go. Fast to freedom, Welcome back to Open the Voice Gate for June 13th, 2023. We are members of the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. You can find us on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network feed or on our own dedicated podcast feed on all podcast platforms and applications. You can follow us on Twitter at Open Voice Gate. If you would like to donate to the show, click the link in the show notes. It'll take you to our redcircle.com landing site. You click the red box that says Sponsor This Podcast and you can set up a one-time or reoccurring donation. No obligation whatsoever, but we would like to thank all of our previous donors. I'm one of your hosts. It's your old pal, Mike Spears, joining alongside, as always, your other co-host, Case Slow. And Case, how are you doing today? I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. You know, Mike dealing with storms on his end. I'm dealing with storms on my end. But, you know, we, we keep on keeping on, and I, I'm glad to talk to you. A lot, a lot to talk about this week, actually. I've got quite a bit of notes for this episode. Yeah, this is, after last week being the kind of episode that that was, we're kind of more back into the swing of things, especially as this last weekend was the last network shows up until July 1st at Kobe Art Center, leading up, of course, to Kobe World 2022 coming up on July 2nd. But we, we're, we're not starting the big full breakdown of Kobe Pro Wrestling Festival 2023, though, case okay. so we're we're, we're going to talk about stuff that's been breaking down and making sense of this car before we do that. But case, well, I feel we're, like we're two weeks out from World, which I feel yeah, like we are. I haven't wrapped my head around. I mean, we were just talking about some pre-production stuff off the air. I, it we're it's here. It's happening. We have the full card. It's jarring. I don't think any of us are ready for it, but it's exciting at the same time. I did figure out my column for this year's world today and i feel like now that like i didn't realize I, even though i've been saying it for like a month and a half now case how many weeks we are we are away from kobe world it didn't sink in for me either until we were trying to scheduling things out 10 minutes ago like it, it, well, it's basically here <laughs> please drop me a dm of what your column idea is because i too spend time thinking about that today um before before we get to kobe world can we talk about gleet for a second Oh, you know how much I like talking about New Sense Pro Wrestling. About all 732 fans they had in uh, Cork and Hall last week? Not, uh, that might be, I think, the, like, expectations versus, like, uh, execution, the worst attended, or, like, the the worst, like, peripherally Cork and Hall show since we've gone back to noise crowds, I feel like. It, it is the shining star in the sky of look if you are into the uwf stuff that's fine you're allowed to like what you like i'm not i'm not coming at your throat there but 
this was a a show built around a singular UWF match in maybe All Japan Saito Brothers, if you really want to throw them in there. And they did 732 fans for Cork and Hall. They're headlining their Tokyo Dome City anniversary show, second anniversary the same weekend as Kobe World, with a UWF match. Now, granted, Fujita Jr. Hayato's in it, which is cool, but still a UWF match. And they have now decided to book Sumo Hall on a combination G Pro Wrestling, uh, Ledet UWF, and Gleet MMA crossover events. It, it is a number of head scratching moves, one after another after another. And I got to tell you, Mike, I watched this uh, parts of this rather, this Cork and Hall show from June 7th, which is on YouTube. Have you seen any of this show yet? It is on my watch list for tomorrow morning. Like, I, I, I'm i completely spoiled, but, like, I, I haven't had the time to sit down and watch that. And I was like, okay, that's Wednesday morning. I want to get through. Uh, Gleet version EX face-off access to TDCH 2023. Yeah, it really rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Well, I, 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 I love curious. it. I love it. <laughs> I'm curious when you watch this show, you know, the the one match that jumped out to me, because I, I didn't care about the Saito brothers. I I really like the idea of Black Generation International on paper, but they have really not connected with me, and I want to talk more about them in just a second. The one match that on paper jumped out to me was the G-Rex title contendership match, Soma Watanabe and Tetsuya Izuchi, which if you've listened to this podcast and you've listened to us talk about Gleet, a promotion that I think we're very fair about, very honest, realistic, and fair about, these are two guys who I time after time have said, man, I, I think they're both immensely talented. Soma Watsnabe in particular, I think, got it. You know, I'd, I'd like to get my hands on him and see what, what I can do with him from a creative perspective, whether I put him in an alternate universe Strangate or I put him in an alternate universe to Japan or he tours the world uh, akin to a, a non-contracted uh, Kanosuke Takeshita. Whatever it is, I just think that guy has immense talent. And so I was excited for this Watsnabe versus Azuchi, Azuki match. And... My takeaway from it was, oh my God, this match sounded like it took place in front of a clap crowd. I mean, these guys killed themselves in the ring, technically proficient, a few giant spots in this match, and no one cared. These guys are not over. And I am a, a, a rabid Watanabe supporter, and towards the finishing stretch of this match, he does a 450 splash to the back of Azuchi. And then a 450 splash uh, uh, in a more traditional way, and it got no pop. And, and I was just alarmed by this entire thing where, you know, you have what you have with strong hearts. They're going to bring X number of people to the building, and it's diminishing returns. Uh, uh, apparently, that's about at max 700 people, I think, yes. <laughs> at this yeah. point. You know, and then, okay, so you're you're going to put some faith in Takanori Ito and, and Shinya Aoki. And that's 730 fans again with that headlining. So who gives a shit about that? You know, we both like Tamora and Shimatani. There's no evidence that they are any different than Watanabe. You know, they're wrestlers that we really like from an aesthetic and a technical standpoint, but they have no star power there. I don't I don't know what it is. I was just alarmed watching Watanabe and Azuchi go out there and kill themselves and get no reaction. It's it should be a notebook match, but the crowd was so dead I I didn't feel comfortable representing that on a, a four stars or better list. It, it, it's something that, I mean, as we've been getting more into uh this year, uh, no one gets a reaction. Like, lo, lo, like that is like the insane thing. Like you, you would think that like a Czech Shimatani call would be bread and butter Shimaism, right? Like, like that is something that like he could do like a gesture and the crowd chants check with him. Like that's, obvious right they don't do that they, they, there's like no appeal there like you, you know on some of these shows what's the most overact case i don't e i don't even know jan's family a comedy diner yeah. gimmick yeah that's that, that's what i mean i just i don't i don't see the direction for any of these guys here and specifically you know i i look at kaito ishida he came into the company he was he left dragon gate in june of last year debuted in Glee in October. Is he in a better position now than he was a year ago? Is he in a better position now than he was two years ago? And I know we have a lot of unironic 
died in the wool Gleet fans that listen to this podcast and also pay attention to Dragon Gate, and that's a legitimate question for them that I, I would love to hear back from on the Voices of Wrestling Discord. Does Ashita come across like a star to you? Because Ashita came in, he popped a house in October, him and June Kasai put together that thousand plus Cork and Hall crowd for Gleet, which was impressive. And then he he rolled through Osaka and he did a, Hak- a, a Hokkaido show. And then in November, they turned him heel. And it was immediately weird. And then they beat him at Tokyo Dome City in December, only so he could win the title in Osaka, his hometown in January. He loses the title to T-Hawk, and now he's just a guy on the roster. Like, it's crazy to me the rapid uh, devalue that Kaito Shida has suffered. This is a guy who should still mean something. He should mean something going into your anniversary show. He hasn't even been in the promotion a year. And to me, I'm just, I'm flabbergasted when I watch him. He comes across as a total non-entity to me. Yeah, and it's something that you can almost say, you play the game of, is it how he's been booked or is it him? But, but like, and that's like the overall like thing about this promotion in my mind is it's just like, is it just how everything's combined? Is that why business is so God awful? Is it, is it the creative mind? I don't, I think that there are certain things that you, you, you know, we got the rough edges of Shimaism kind of ground down because of the committee, like back in the day, but I just look at this thing and it's not like they don't have people who are talented. Like you're saying, like, Check I like the heart of this roster. This is a promotion that I should enjoy. Yeah, there's a lot there. And I mean, for like, I like Ito. I think that Jan's family and like having to deal with that. And now the fact that he is the uh, Ledet UWF champion, I think that's very discordant. I it, it, This whole tournament and the build to him winning this when it's been kind of proven that this stuff does not really draw has been befuddling. Like the... the the sumo hall thing case is probably going to be. Can you honestly say that unless, with the caveat of this is a company that is willing to bring whoever in, with this core roster case, do they even draw fifteen hundred? I mean, they draw a thousand to Tokyo Dome City. They did twelve hundred for the anniversary show last year that was headlined by Yuji Nagata, and then they did a thousand fans for Lindemann versus Ashida in December. And I, you know, if, if you look at the, and the new, is trending down, it, it, you can't it, say that yes. the is, is in a better place than they were in December. No one. And, and I say this with all the love in the world towards Soma Watanabe, but he's second from the top on this Tokyo Dome city show coming up on July 1st. It's T-Hawk versus Watanabe in the G-Rex title match. And then the, UWF championship match first uh first champion Takanori Ito versus Hayato Jr. Fujita I don't know what that draws I you know there's a there's a lose, losing unit disbands match between bulk orchestra and 60 seconds Mike right now name the four members of 60 seconds in this match uh, Izzy Uchi yeah uh Tancho yep Sato and Shiba Okay, you're a pervert. I was not expecting you to get that. I mean, gun to my head. I, I would have gotten a Zuchi and that's it. I, I, bulk orchestra I could have handled because it's Kawakami and Tamura and Shimatani and Kazuma Sakamoto. Kazuma Sakamoto, another guy who, look, he got the bag. He's a Gleek contracted wrestler. Good for him. But I I miss him in Dragon Gate. I think he'd be much better off in, in, in Dragon Gate currently. So you have this bulk orchestra 60 seconds unit disbands match, which, I, you know, does anybody in the world care about 60 seconds? I, I would almost hope they lose just because bulk orchestra has become, you know, a, a part of the fabric of this promotion. And then you have those two title matches. The the one thing that I will praise them for, are you ready for a Gleek compliment, Mike? Oh, I'm always ready for this. They did book one hell of a match for this show. They booked L Lindemann, Kento Miyahara and Bandito versus Kaito Ishida, Kotaro Suzuki and Flamita. I, have said a lot of bad things about this promotion that match is incredible well you're also bearing the lead a little bit we are getting owe participation on this on this uh, g on this late version six show in the opener as i'm stunned to see but uh junji from 
OWE is going to be in the opener tier, teaming with Shigehiro Irie versus former Strong Hearts member and current Yon family. I don't know what he is. I have Freikuk, uh, Issei on- on- Onizuka, and Yosuke Kazama. Like, there are things on this show like that I look at. And, y- you know, like the-, the trios match, Bulk Orchestra versus BGI, like, I would like to see, like, like you have Commander in that. And and El Bendito, you, you would like to see like a strong performance there. This is not like a card that is awful, but it is a card that is looking like when you have the Saito twins third from the top facing Kaz Hayashi and Minoru Tanaka. I wonder about the health of your promotion. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I, I don't. I don't know what to do with them. I really just. It's a promotion that I think. A lot of people were mad at Dragon Gate for various reasons last year. And this is not me having a dog in the fight. This is just wrestling, you know, looking at wrestling from an analytical perspective and and trends. I think a lot of people were frustrated with Dragon Gate last year for a number of different reasons. Kaito Ishida jumped to Gleet. It was exciting. And it was exciting. I was into it as well. And so people people in in our bubble started giving them a lot of credit. A lot of gleek talk that I don't think was entirely deserved. And now, you know, I, I I know four or five people that watch the promotion on a regular basis. And, I you know, I try to keep tabs on it. And I really don't understand the booking. I never understand what's going on in the promotion. I worry that no one not named Shima, T-Hawk, Lindemann, or commentator Masato Yoshino are over. And even then, again, diminishing returns. I, I, I really emphasize to people last year. Masato Yoshino coming into that promotion. Yes, he's a commentator. Yes, he's an authority figure. No, he's not an active wrestler. That that was done to pull fans into the building. At least that first run, you know, of Yoshino and Cork in the first few times. That that was supposed to be a big deal, and it just fell flat in this promotion. I it it's sort of I don't know. It's a promotion that falls flat. I don't know what to do. I I. Now at this point, if they're, if they're going to draw bad numbers, which I, I think is going to be a trend for a while, at least right. put cool stuff like that six man because that six man is that that is that is a match that I can get behind. Yeah, and uh, gun to your head, case. Uh, Shima's been out, I think, since last November or thereabouts, beginning of this year. Shima on these cards, how many more are you expecting to like walk in there? Like. I don't know if that does enough really to turn the tide here. I don't know necessarily. Like I know like like he is one of the people that does have a prominent fan club or at one time had one. I don't know if it's just like, Oh, a situation, not unlike uh, all Japan uh, five, six years ago, with Kento Miyahara. Right. Like I, it, it's not like that. Oh, we're holding tide until Shima gets back. It's not like that. He's going to be the, the the cure here and on the other hand you look at these cards and you look at what they're promising at sumo hall and what they do on these great like big shows and it's a whole lot of everything and here's the like case have you ever been to a golden corral in your life (laughs) yes mike i am white trash but so you're able to get a little bit of everything at golden corral but is anything what you would say a a great quality no it's it's a buffet you're you're getting as much as you possibly can uh with with you're not expecting excellence in return you're expecting mass quantity and that's kind of what i look at this company now and it's like oh you get a lucha six man you get a women's match that has names of other eras and like the prominent indie star and Unaki Sayaka. You, you have two UWF matches, including one that has Shinya Aoki in it. You have, you, you have an all Japan tag team. You have a unit disbands match. You have, you, you have an OWE wrestler and you have all of that. And you kind of take a step back and it's just like, what do you really have when you combine it all? Is it the, the sum is not necessarily greater than all the individual parts. I look at this now. Yeah, I think that's a very good way of describing it. It's a buffet of wrestling, and I, I think Japan is at a time where they really need excellence. They need fine dining. They they need quality, and we're just getting a hodgepodge of names here. And it, it's not working for me. Look, I, I'm I'm curious. If you're into Gleet, tell me what you like about it. I'm really curious about this promotion and if it's resonating with anybody in our bubble. 
Yeah, and I I always come back to this case. I wonder how this company is able to exist. I Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, look, if if they announced the Sumo Hall show was the last show, I don't think either of us would bat an eye. I don't think we'd go, oh, my God, we didn't see this coming. We'd be like, no, it makes sense. They, they got some they, – they have some air quote stars on this roster, and they just never see the, the return. Right, yeah. And, I, I and now their, their heel unit is based out of Mexico. So they've got to fly all those guys in for every show. Yeah, because if you don't fly them in, then you have Kataro Suzuki, Harley Jackson, and Kaito Ishida. And the people want Galeno Del Mall. He should be T-Hawk for the title. I'd be so into that, actually. Honestly, at this point, I think Bulk Orchestra should kind of become the overriding unit. You know, like, get Galeno Del Mall the G-Rex. I think that he's going to just crater T-Hawk, send him off into the retirement that he that, that, that has allegedly been threatened for years now. And, and, and then we could, you know who I think we need to toss into the Ledette UWF division out of Folk Orchestra? Who's that? Quiet Storm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, hey, credit to any guy that can keep a job for that long. I don't I don't always understand it, but credit to him. Hey, hey, all, all I got to say is I've started doing Total Extreme Warfare, and I'm thinking... I can make this a whole lot worse really quickly. <laughs> All right, Mike. I got a bunch of Dragon Age stuff I want to talk about. You ready? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Uh, you you have the lead here. We have a main event for Kobe World. We actually have a full card, but we, we have an official main event. Why don't you tell the people how we got here? All right. So the, uh, the uh, previously set... Uh, Four-way steel cage survival. Uh, plus this match after this Sunday shows in across Fukuoka. It is now a five-way with the introduction of Dragon Kid. As Dragon Kid requested to enter the match after the events of last Sunday. And to support Ultimo Dragon. G GM Ryo Saito has finally announced the rules of this match. So this, for those who are new to Dragon Gate, the... Steel Cage Survival Match usually has different rules each year. Some years it is an Apuestas like this. Some years it's like some years it is a title match. It's not always the same thing. But this year there will only be escape, and the way you escape the cage is to climb atop the cage case and grab your own mask. So Diamante can't get Strong Machine J's mask. Ultimo can only get his. And capturing the mask means you can escape. And as and of course, as how most of these matches go, the last competitor in the cage will lose their match, their mask. And now that is the confirmed main event, which I, I this has been bugging me as I've maybe like wish wishing for this. We're in for probably a two, if not three intermission show, if you include the opening matches. So let's start there with the, with the cage match being the main event. This is the second time. I guess the third time, if you count Masato Yoshino's retirement, the third time in Dragon Gate history, the Dream Gate match has not headlined a Kobe World Show. There are Shima versus Magnitude Kishiwada in 2006, which was a no ropes match, which was, as we referenced last week, A plus level Shima politicking, where he booked a no ropes match for himself on the biggest show of the year. He's like, well, you know, we're. We can't take him off and then put him back on. I guess Dragon Kid and Susumu are just going to go uh, go on before me. I, you know, it's just what we're going to have to do. It was a, a truly a everyone's playing checkers and she was playing chess moment. And then you obviously have the Masato Yoshino retirement from 2021 Speed Star Final, which was Doi and Yoshino versus Hulk and Ata, and that went on after Yamato versus Shun Skywalker for the Dream Gate belt. Just off the bat, you know. Uh, I have a lot to say about this Dreamgate match this year, Kakucha and Yoshioka. But off the bat, do you think it's a big deal that the cage match is headlining over the Dreamgate match? Is that something, uh, if you care about the business of Dragon Gate at all, that you should be concerned or make note of? I think that if this was a face versus heel Dreamgate match, you've just now opened a way to, for a heel to win at Kobe World because you'll have the main event with the feel-good ending after that. You know, like, yeah. so like it, it, it could have been interesting in that regard. But am I surprised? No, I was hoping it wasn't going to happen. It, it just pure logistics and the fact that Dragon Gate builds their cage each time they do one of these matches. It, it, it's something that it was going to take a whole lot of time out of the show to do. So I was hoping it was either going to be like 
uh, something you could set up coming out of intermission, and then you have all the video packages afterwards that you can go dark and take down the cage for the main event. Logistically, it makes more sense to put on the cage. Either you start with the cage up or you end the show with the cage up. It just makes more sense that way. Uh, do I think it pulls focus a little bit? Not after how they kind of treated the Dreamgate build in Fukuoka, to be honest. Like, the, like it's clear what the number one storyline now going into Kobe world is going to be. It's the masks. So, Yeah, that's, that's where I'm at. You know, uh, I, was, I was advocating for Kakuta versus Yoshioka as soon as Kakuta won the belt at Dead or Alive, which, you know, uh, to, to remind people how on the ball I've been, I said Skywalker would beat Yoshioka. I said Kakuta would beat Skywalker, and then they do Kakuta versus Yoshioka at World. That's exactly what's happened. I did not expect the journey to World to look like this, and I'm a little taken aback by what they've done, because if you look at the last 10 or so matches that Yoshioka, we'll use him as the specific example here, has had, you know, he he's set up for the Dreamgate match in Osaka on May 28th, and he's teaming with Daya and Kakuta in that match. The next day, the three of them team together again. At Cork and Hall two days later, the three of them team together again. June 2nd, okay, now we're doing Dragon Daya and Yuki Yoshioka versus Dragon Kid and Madoka Kakuta. And then the matches that have followed, Yoshioka versus Estrella, a D-Courage Trios match, a D-Courage Trios match, Kakuta and Yoshioka teaming together versus Big Boss Shimizu and Jackie Funky Kamei. That match was on YouTube. That match is fantastic, but I don't understand why it needed to happen. And then you go D-Courage tag team match with Kakuta and Yoshioka versus Ben and Minora uh, in Fukuoka. And then a D-Courage Trios match in Fukuoka. And then the next day, a D-Courage Trios match. They are teaming Kakuta and Yoshioka together, and it's not like there's tons of friendly fire or friction or tension between the two. It's as if there's not a giant title match booked between them in two weeks. I'm baffled by this, and for the sake of this podcast, the cage match main eventing actually make things f- makes things far more uninteresting, because if this was the build and the Dreamgate match was headlining, we would have to have some serious talks about what the attendance in this building would be. With the cage match, I feel a little bit more confident that they'll be in line of what is an air quote success in 2023. But Mike, I don't understand. This is the match that they should do. This is the biggest Dreamgate match they could book right now. Kakuta versus Yoshioka in the build just does not make any sense whatsoever. And it's pointed how much they are not having any conflict. Like, in Fukuoka, there was a potential for a cross-up spot, and they pulled up the brakes, and it was like, oh no, now instead it's going to be me doing moves involving you versus you colliding your partner. That They've been making a point about that Kakuda and Yoshioka, there's no animosity. And it kind of, like, it's ultimately a good thing that this isn't main eventing with this with distraction because as you're saying like there it is something that it feels almost like exhibition exhibitiony and it's not that i think that it needed to have these two guys at the throats and decourage you know being threatened to be torn asunder it's just it, it, it it's very much like hey we are facing off here i have the key i have the belt we'll see you in two weeks and Unless this is like a pointed thing that maybe after Kobe World or at Kobe World, that's when the friction really starts building up and we have a fall of can D Courage get through it, especially if King of Gate are they, can Kakuda and Yoshioka uh, t- tolerate each other? Like, unless that's what we're going, then it just feels like that it's like, okay, we're doing Kakuda versus Yoshioka and that's fine. I really like this Kobe world card. I mean, I think this show has the potential to be absolutely outstanding. I don't love the twin gate match, which is Susumu and Kanda versus BB Hulk and Ben K just because I don't, I, you know, it's a, it's a liability when, when twin gate matches are historically the best thing on a world show. Kanda and Hulk being in the same match makes me a little bit nervous. But I think I'm even more excited for that than the Dreamgate match now. I mean, coming out of Osaka and those two Korokan shows, I was fired up. This is the match they should do. I'm glad they're doing it. They're finding two guys uh, that, that are arguably peaking right now, at least in this phase in their career. It seems like they're at their apex. And I just, I don't, I don't get it. 
I, I mean, I, I feel like I'm missing something. I feel like I miss shows at some point here because what I, I, I don't know. I'm baffled because if the story is, okay, well, can D Courage stick together after this match? Yoshioka has to win, right? You know, this has to be a deal where Kakuta brought Yoshioka to the table. Yoshioka brought Kakuta into the unit to begin with. And now Yoshioka is going to show him who's boss. I mean, that to me is starting to become the front runner outcome for this show. Yeah. Yeah. And then, I mean, I take a look at how D Courage is constructed and the state of the Reiwa Big Six. And you probably like, like getting some movement is not a bad thing. And especially with the state of Zebrats, where it is that, I mean, it, we were talking earlier, we were talking last year, okay, this heal unit's too good. And now it's five members, essentially. You, you're probably going to want to change that around. I just, I wonder if the storyline should be, okay, Kakuda puts him so much into his place that Yoshioka gets resentful and then turn. Yeah, it certainly seems like something has to come out of this match. If they're not going to do something big going into it, and I had thrown out the idea a month ago of, you know, okay, well, if this is the direction they go, does Yoshioka turn heel a month before World? Do we really shake the snow globe now? And I, I don't think that would have been the, the necessarily the best route to go, but it would have been an avenue to at least explore. I don't have the answer, nor do I want to really deviate into fantasy booking of what they could have done instead of this. But I do know that unless I'm really missing something, unless there's a cultural difference that I'm just not getting, and, and quite frankly, I feel pretty confident that that's not the case, this is a this is a swing and a miss. This is a really big whiff. And I, I, I'm of the belief, you know, given what we know about the cage match, just from watching the build, that that was going to be the main event. And I, I'm into the cage match build. We'll talk more about it in just a second. But uh, the the decourage stock, if these guys are the main characters of Dragon Gate, the decourage stock has taken a bit of a hit here. I'm not saying sell, 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 but I'm, I, you know, to, to not repeat myself again, but I'm baffled by this. And, you know, Zebrats needs a refresher. I think Yoshioka going full on heel would be very interesting after world, but tease that have these guys in some fashion or form wrestle one another. And if they're going to team together, Yoshioka needs to be eating hand of God lariats by accident. Kakuta needs to be uh, getting frog splashed on by accident. Th there needs to be a whole lot more, but right now it's business as usual. And I, I don't understand it. I wonder if you're talking about, like shakeups and decourage taking a hit. I wonder if this is the cash in that, oh, we built them up so much that we could have decourage versus decourage second from the top. And because they are the main characters, we don't we don't have to do build towards it or we don't have to do a whole lot of work. And I guess like my counter to that logic is it's not like there's a restriction to how many tickets you can sell here now. And wouldn't you want to provide re more reasoning for that, you know? I don't know. So that, was, so that was my argument two weeks ago when the match was announced. I said the build to this match is simply that the match exists. The announcement that Kakuta is wrestling Yoshioka, that is what is going to set this in motion. That alone is going to be the ticket seller for this. But I just assumed halfway through June, we wouldn't be getting D Courage versus Vibes matches just for the hell of it. You know, I, I thought, okay, well, they'll announce, announce the match. And then, you know, we'll have a show that is, you know, Kakucha and Shimizu versus Yoshioka and Jason Lee. And, you know, we'll do some hodgepodge booking through World to get us there. But the thing that matters is that the match was announced and that we'll move on from there. And instead, we've just, you know, I, I, it, nothing has happened. You know, it's just these guys are teaming with one another. It's completely and utterly bizarre. I can't remember a Dreamgate build that looks quite like this. You know, a few weeks ago, we talked about all of the unit, uh, same unit versus same unit Dreamgate matches that have happened. And in a lot of those, they're either wrestling, you know, one another, or they're just kept apart. I don't remember a scenario in which they're just teaming up through the match. That is so weird. And especially to do it, you know, think about all the heel units that we've had throughout the years where friendly fire is the end of them. You know, all of the units that we've had over the years that have been in a unit disbands match with a story going in is can they keep it together or will they self implode? This is the, this is the time to do that. This is the match to do that. Cause you can get maximum return on your investment here. And they're not doing that. Yeah, and it, it's something that now, case 
you said it two weeks ago. They haven't done the build. They they, they literally kind of stepped away from it. It's like this is the match, and and that's what we are going into Kobe World with. Uh, let's go back over the cage match. Yeah, yeah, I think, please. The, this is the the main event of Kobe World this year. Yep, the main event of Kobe World this year, the five way Apuesta Steel Cage Survival Match. Uh, how do you feel about Dragon Kid kind of being interjected into this as basically? Hey, I want to help out. I think it's a tactical move. I think it's a very smart move. You know, before we had the full card last week, I was advocating for the Dreamgate match to headline. Boy, how things change. And part of that was I was saying, look, I just I have a hard time envisioning Kobe World ending with Strong Machine J and Diamante being the focus of this match. Uh, well, you know, at the time, the four-way mask versus mask match, and now it's a five-way with Dragon Kid involved. And I think that's because Dragon Kid, you know, essentially a martyr for Ultimo Dragon, who does not like him, will be one of the final two guys in the cage. I don't think Dragon Kid is losing his mask. I don't think Ultimo Dragon is losing his mask. I think it's a very slim chance that Shun Skywalker is losing his mask, a very slim chance that Strong Machine J is losing his mask. I think it's very likely Diamante loses his mask, but I do think it now comes down to Diamante and Dragon Kid uh, rather than Strong Machine J or Ultimo or another weird heel versus heel scenario, whereas the Dreamgate match is face versus face with Shun and Diamante. I think it's a deliberate move. I loved the way they did it. I loved the main event of the second Fukuoka show that was Strong Machine J and Ultimo versus Shun and Diamante. It ends in a DQ at first when uh, Diamante attacks referee Yagi. Dragon Kid comes out, makes himself the referee, and it is a barn burner sprint main event to the finish where dragon kid ddt shun skywalker and then ultimo dragon rolls him up with the lamai straw that was a hot angle you know i talked earlier about watanabe versus azuchi being a dead crowd fukuoka i don't know how you felt i felt like they were into this story yeah i as much as i was kind of interested going into this weekend we had such warm feelings about those april fukuoka shows right like it was something i was like hey okay this venue is still kind of weird but you know the crowd it's not Star Lanes, but you know we're still in Hakata. You know, like yeah. that was like a ni- that was like a nice thing, and I really felt on the uh, I on both uh, shows that the crowd got into like the big stuff. Like especially, I mean, I was like shocked by like uh, the amount of calls for Dragon Daya throughout the day. Like Dragon Daya might have been the most over person in Hakata. Like, like that, but but as it relates to the main event, I adored it. I like the idea of just doing this completely unhinged unsustainable tag match the the match that shun skywalker wanted to have at kobe world by the way and it just completely break down to the point that like rio saito is just like shouting at diamante to stop attacking referees <laughs> and then and then dragon kid being like yeah uh i have referee experience let me get in on this and then finishing it that way uh i i, I do wonder about your point that it's going to be kid and diamante i just maybe this is a more wide discussion that we might have with some guests over the next few weeks but i almost feel like that dragon kid doesn't get anything out of the mask but but that also could be a conversation about how dragon gate the apuestas usually are more important for the loser than they are for the winner gaining a valuable mask oh so your your point is dragon kid doesn't really get anything from surviving this match no no when he takes diamante's mask it I, he's in the exact same position coming, coming okay, out. Well, well, let's break that down from that perspective. Who who gains something? You know, Strong Machine J gains something if he takes Shun Skywalker's mask. And I think vice versa. I think Shun Skywalker gains something if he takes Strong Machine J's mask. Is there another scenario where anyone gains anything from taking someone's mask? I think Diamante... I, I think... Sorry. I think Strong Machine J in any scenario gets a lot out of winning the mask because if you look at him his credentials are triangle gate run when he was a rookie like we talk about him being the sixth in the big six and walking out of kobe uh kenan world hall with the with at least like diamante's mask yes that is out of the four undoubtedly to the promotion the least valuable mask but it's still something you know and i and i think that undoubtedly puts him in a lot better position going into King of Gate season. Okay, so so Jay's in an advantageous position. 
I think no matter what, because even if he loses, that's really interesting. You know, he he is almost Teflon in this. I don't envision a scenario in which he leaves this match in a worse spot than he came into it in. Ultimo doesn't, you know, he's. I think he's going to be the first one out of the cage. I believe. I think Ultimo's going to big payday to well, do not a lot of work. Let, let, <laughs> yeah. Let's take care of the elderly. And, and, and I've noticed people talk about the prospects of Ultimo losing the mask. I just like if you're adhering to lucha tradition, I think Ultimo's mask is out of Dragon Gate's immediate price range unless this match is sponsored yeah i just wh- why would he lose it you know what i mean like he yeah. shows he shows up to wrestlemania weekend in every bad indie in the country and just rakes in money because he was on nitro 25 years ago why why would he give that up yeah and he gets absolutely nothing being the last uh escape like then it's like oh look ulta it, it, we sat through probably a half hour of Ultimo Dragon in a cage match. Like, like we all come out worse for that. Yeah, no, he's, he, he's, my man's getting out of there, okay? He's climbing the cage. He's getting out of there. I hope, my fear is that it's going to be like a homicide, oh, what, what was that stupid match called? The Steel Asylum, that red cage that TNA used, where Ultimo's going to have trouble getting out of the cage. That is my, right. that is actually the most interesting thing that can happen to Ultimo in this match. Yeah, and, and, like, the sad thing is, like, unlike other Steel Cage Survival Mask match with everyone banned, it's not like Hulk can throw his rope in to help the guy out here. It's it, I, I, I don't mean to sound <laughs> like I'm being, <laughs> I'm just thinking being about awful here. The, the literal ladder that they threw into the ring uh, in 2011 when Cyber Kong needed to right. escape Blood, Blood Warriors used a ladder to get him out of there. That is, I gotta rewatch that. The Gate of Destiny 2011 blood warriors junction three cage match that was one of the matches that really sold me on dragon gate as you know there's no other match that has ever looked like that before <laughs> they just throw in a la- hey he, this dude's not getting up there we gotta throw in the ladder um yeah so- yeah, yeah are, are we gonna see like a like the most useful pow- uh tower of doom spot to just get uh ultimo up onto the cage itself yeah i, I you know the no seconds thing is interesting because I, I feel like that means something. If it were, I, I, you know, if it were a month and a half ago, I'd go, well, SB Kento will return. I don't think that's going to happen now. No, um, no. I think but, I think that's changed. But, but, but case to continue your point, I would say that like, I wonder if at least for international fans, there's such a mental image about the Dragon Gate cage match. And a lot of that is the fact that you would get like, remote control Masaki Mochizuki or uh or uh, Masato Yoshino taking uh taking batting practice like a lot of it was that because of the seconds and now this is I feel like in, in a way this is going to have to be a, an even more brutal match for whatever the international fan expectation is just because of those 2011 through 2016 cage matches oh I think I think Shun and Strong Machine J will kill each other I mean I you know there's I hope we're not done with that feud. I I hope that continues to go because this feels, you know, this feels like a big chapter. This feels like an important chapter, but I don't know if this is the end for them. I I really feel like those two have a, let's go out there and kill each other to the point that it almost doesn't fit into Dragon Gate style of match. And I think they're, they're certainly going to explore that route here. No, you're right. This will be brutal. Again, Ultimo is going to get out of there and then, you know, it's Shun Monte versus Strong Machine J and Dragon Kid, essentially. And, you know, Ultimo gains nothing from this match. Dragon Kid gains nothing from this match. Shun, I think it's nice if he takes Strong Machine J's mask, but I don't think that's likely. And Diamante lo- gains far more by losing his mask than he does, I think, taking someone else's. And it's something that I just, like, look at this match and... At least, like, they could play it straight down the middle. Like, not have any sort of turn b- between Shun Monte, but I'd, a, I feel like that like that is going to be something that I would put money down on, that, like, Shun gets protective about his mask, turns on Diamante, and that kick starts the face turn. The, the beautiful thing is they have a built-in story, assuming, you know, Diamante, if he loses his mask, he's obviously going to turn face. And they have a built-in story there because Shun turned on Dragon Daya to save his mask and he can do the same thing to Diamante heal and it will only double down on Shun's character and it will make Diamante twice as lovable. And I 
I'm having a hard time envisioning a scenario in which that doesn't happen where, you know, it's Shun and Diamante and let's say Dragon Kid, and then, you know, Shun turns on Diamante and and we get uh we get the scenario that we get. Yeah, and it's something that I look at how this year is laid out, and they go five days later straight into King of Gate. There is a path where you get to have like momentum for whoever wins or loses this match. And at least with how that bracket is set up, I have to more look at it. It's like, okay, whoever the five, the four people in this match that are in King of Gate can come out of this with some sort of momentum going into King of Gate season. Right. Yeah. Now I've got to, I've got to remember. So Diamante is wrestling Susumu on the July 7th Quirk and Show. And that that's an easy first round win for a babyface Diamante. That makes sense. That's right. A, that's that's right up his alley. Then after that, I don't have the English translated bracket in front of me, so I don't know I don't know what would come after that. But Susumu round one, that's an that's a win for Diamante, I think, no matter what. Yeah, no. I- and I think that makes the this main event really fascinating because you do have now setting up whoever's coming out of this into King Gate season. And then as well, it's, I mean, either Yoshioka or Kakuda are walking out of Kobe World and into King Gate as champion. And it's, the, the, there's a lot of like external factors that I feel like influences the field this year. And it starts with that cage match. Completely. And then... You know, the other thing that I want to talk about with this cage match, because it's Kobe World and it's going to be a show that a lot of people that maybe don't keep up on Dragon Gate throughout the year are going to watch. And perhaps the last time they watched Dragon Gate was Kobe World 2022. On the surface, just posing this question, what do you think about Ultimo Dragon being in another Kobe World main event after he was in one last year uh, against, uh, well, I guess a semi-main event last year. He had the whole show booked around him, uh, him versus Santo, and then the ensuing Peros versus Ultimo, Santo, and Great Sasuke six-man. I mean, I in an ideal world, I wouldn't be giving valuable screen time real estate to someone who's not going to be in the promotion probably in five to ten years. Like, there's that for sure. But I, I, I feel a lot better about this him in this position here where it's not it, it, we're not being threatened with a singles match with a combined age of about 120 like that, <laughs> yeah. that, that, that there's not a lot of ways to make that worse for me so you know this year will be four years of ultimo dragon and dragon Gate, which is crazy to think about first of all did you realize that that he's now been back for four years it it's one of those things that like I, I wonder if I would feel more organic about it, but like, yeah, no, that makes sense if we did not have COVID. Yeah. So I put together a list of the important Ultimo Dragon matches since he's returned to Drangy because I think, at least I'm worried, that there's going to be this unfair narrative that Ultimo Dragon is pushing himself, his ego put him in the main event, why do they feature this old guy, and I... I simply don't think that's true. You know, if you look at the history of his time in Dragon Gate, 2019, he comes in, debuts July 21st, 2019. It's Dragon Kid, Yoshino, and Ultimo versus Mochizuki, Shuji Kondo, and Takuya Sugawara. And for most of 2019, and, you know, we have audio of this, and I certainly have a lot of writing on this. You know, I was I was very concerned about the idea of Ultimo coming to Dragon Gate, what it meant in the ring, and what it meant behind the scenes, because... You know, he's not up to the caliber of a standard Dragon Gate wrestler. He's below average for this company, which is always makes me laugh because then he shows up in Noah and has the same match and people are very impressed by him just because the working standard there is lower. But, you know, 2019, he has his debut match. He starts getting real uh, features in Corkin, you know, Doi and Yoshino and Ultimo versus Kness and Kagatora and Rio Saito. They have the uh, BB Hulk and Kai and Ultimo match versus Dragon Kid, Jason Lee and Masato Yoshino. There's the Magic Gate of Origin. That's BB Hulk and Kagatora and Kai and Yamato versus Dragon Kid, Great Sasuke, uh, Jinsei Shinzaki, and Ultimo Dragon. And then you start to pivot into Ultimo versus Eito, which was a big focus over the last half of 2019, where you know you get Masked Guys versus Red, 
and you get Shimizu and Ata versus Ultimo and Kanda. Then you get Ultimo versus Ata in Cork and Hall, December 4th, 2019, a show that did not draw great. And a match, by the way, just to uh, show you an era in time, that match ends in DQ and it turns into Ata, a recently unmasked green mask Kaito Ishida, and masked red mask uh, wrestler versus Masao Yoshino, Naruki Doi, and Ultimo Dragon. That is how that Cork and Hall show ends, which I just feel is worth pointing out. That is a, quite a time and place in history, right, Mike? Yeah, I, I remember thinking that the like demon mask angle was like the coolest thing. Like it, it was it, awesome. It, it was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And especially like right after Ishida winning the Brave Gate in his hometown. Like immediately doing the turn, like I thought it was like, all right, here yeah, we that's go. Yeah, that's the Ishida turn. You know, he he wins the Brave Gate belt match, uh, Brave Gate belt, like you said, at Gate of Destiny that year against Asumu, and then that's where he turns heel and joins Red, and that's how we knew him up until essentially he left the company. So you have, I have nine matches listed as important Ultimo Dragon matches, and that's from July of 2019 through December of 2019, January 2020. He headlines the Torimon reunion show, which he should have, and he was very good there. I have November 3rd, 2020, as an uh, as a important Ultimo Dragon match. It was Kento Kabune, Takedo Kame, and Madoka Kakuta versus Masadi Yoshino, Ultimo Dragon, and Yasushi Kanda. And that is where Kabune pinned Kanda, and then later that night became SB Kento. So that is November 3rd, 2020. The next important Ultimo match is July 31st, 2021 which was one of the Masada Yoshino retirement matches. That was, you know, the uh, Dragon Kid, Kagatora, Yamato, Naruki Doi, and Ultimo versus Kondo, Sugawara, Awashi, Yashi, and Yoshino. And then the next one I have is July 30th, 2022, Santo versus Ultimo and the ensuing tag match. And then July 31st, the six man with the Legends versus Peros. I have two more on the list, one from August because Santo stayed on that tour they had a pretty featured match in Cork and Hall that was, I forgot about this, Dragon Daya, Yuki Yoshioka, El Hijel Del Santo, Ultimo Dragon, and Ho-Ho Loon versus BB Hulk, Diamante, Hyo Kai, and Shun Skywalker. And then I have down May 5th of this year, Naruki Doi and Ultimo Dragon versus Diamante and Hyo because that was a, you know, a short match, but a featured pay-per-view match. In four years, 16 what I would call important matches, and 10 of those came within the first four months he was in Dragon Gate. I just want to get ahead of the narrative. And I have been a critic of Ultimo Dragon. I've been a skeptic of Ultimo Dragon. I haven't loved everything he's done, but he is a guy who operates 98% of the time in meaningless six-man tags, the touch football match, as we've coined it. It is only 2021, 2022, and 2023 Kobe Worlds in which he's done anything of substance. Last year was ridiculed across all corners. It should have been. It was bad. It fell to the box office. Wasn't any good in the ring. This year... He's in a match where he's arguably the fifth most important guy in what has been a great build and what feels like a hot match and what should be a great main event. I just want to get ahead of the narrative that Ultimo Dragon is taking over this company or that they're booking too many old guys or he's taking spots away from young guys because it's simply not true. And case something I would add to this is when, when we like look at the four years, has there been a time with maybe the exception of the yoshino retirement stuff and his return has there been a time that you have seen ultimo who we've now i think terribly have seen probably about 200 matches 250 matches of his in dragon gate since he came back i would say around that amount i'm not gonna look that up as i'm saying this but would you agree with me that we are perhaps seeing the most motivated ultimo across the four years yeah because he's in the ring with diamante and say what you will about Ultimo Dragon, for some reason, he tries really hard when he's in the ring with Diamante. And I think I think part of that is Diamante brings that out of him. You know, he works so hard. He takes such big bumps. He works so fast that Ultimo sort of has to keep up. And I don't, you know, think if he's wrestling Doi or Kanda or Susumu, they push him to that degree. Diamante does. And I think that's why we're in that position. But, you know, look, I, I would have a hard time uh, believing anybody that watched that Fukuoka show, that main event, saw the effort that Ultima put in and saw the way that the crowd reacted to it and could then criticize him being in the main event of this show. It's a, it's an anomaly. Yeah, and just to clarify that point, Case, you found all those matches. Uh, just take a guess. How many matches has Ultimo Dragon had in Dragon Gate since he returned? 
I'll I'll throw your number out there. I'll say 265. 369. Yeah, okay. So there you go. So I have 16 matches going on 17, and he's wrestled 369 times going on 370. I, I think they're doing okay with reigning in Ultimo Dragon. Yeah, and I bet if we did a scatter chart of the matches and where they are on the card, it wouldn't be a scatter chart. It'd be a bar graph. I think we, you would notice that only those 16 matches really have him towards the top of the card. And again, it was, you know, it was largely 2019. And I didn't think those matches were great. I was actually an active critic of most of them. They didn't do great at the box office. And then they, you know, 2020, he's a non-entity post Tori Mon reunion, which again, it was used perfectly on that show. And, you know, I, I I won't repeat the list. 2021, he's in one big match. 2022, he's he's given a lot of focus, and I think the company regrets it. And this year, you know, it's not like Kobe World and the Ultima 35th show happened, and then he challenged for the Dreamgate belt afterwards. You know, he went back to doing the, the for lack of a better term, the bullshit that he was doing, and it's only now, this year's delayed mask versus mask match with Diamante, that they somehow made even more interesting than it would have been on the surface, that he's back in this spot. And I would probably say that unless there is something from Mexico that he wants to do, this is probably it, you know, with him in these kind of positions, just because of like, what can you do with him? You're not going to give him the dream gate. He is someone that he's never never challenged for a title. He hasn't even been like a triangle gate guy. Right. Yeah. So really it is something that I fully assume unless like, there's someone who he sees on his travels he really wants to work with and do a storyline with, which to my interpretation of the situation, Diamante, that's what happened. Unless we have like one of those situations, I fully expect to see him teaming with Ginky Horiguchi and Fuji on match three of Korokins for the next however long he's still with the company. You know, it wouldn't shock me if we get like an Ultimo and Diamante versus Shun Skywalker and Kai Korokin semi-main event. But, you know, if, sure. if that's the case... Great. Yeah. The, but, but like outside of that kind of stuff, what can you do with him? Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. So that, that was, uh, those are my thoughts on Ultimo and the main event. And I would like to let people know that today's podcast is brought to you by the Bet Stamp app, which is helping thousands of people win at sports betting for free. The same way travelers use Google Flights or Expedia to find the best prices, bettors can now use Bet Stamp to do the same. When you place a bet, the odds given by a sportsbook will determine how much you can possibly win. Even when betting on the same outcome, different sportsbooks will offer varying payouts, and these differences can be huge. Thankfully, BetStamp allows you to easily line shop for the most profitable odds across all sportsbooks. You can click on any matchup and instantly see all the different odds for game lines, player props, and even futures bets. Line shopping is the simplest way to find an edge in sports betting and maximize your chances of winning long term. On average, BetStamp users win an extra $1,000 yearly just by line shopping. You can find the BetStamp app on the Apple iOS Store, Google Play Store, or through your browser at www.betstamp.app. To access all these benefits, sign up using promo code VOW and start your journey to successful sports betting today. If you forget to use the code upon sign up, you can always enter our code in your BetStamp account settings afterwards. Check it out. Shall we take a look at this last Sunday shows and across Wukuoka real quick? We should. All right. So it was the average matinee evening double header that they always do whenever they run this building. 324 for your afternoon card. 484 for the evening case you have any big attendance th- thoughts before we get into the matches themselves the evening show number which headlined by ultimo and strong machine jay and shun and diamante that was uh that was a strong number you know 484 beats some of the shows that they were doing in 2019 and we have to remember this is a venue that we first got in may of 2019 the kingdom gate tour was the first time they ran there uh, those shows did 559 and 667, respectively. They did uh, two shows there, not a day-night doubleheader. Uh, for reference, the last shows they ran before the pandemic, which was February 2nd of 2020. A theme I'm noticing here, by the way, 2020 business started off really strong for Dragon Gate, 
and it was just all pissed away. It's such a shame because they they did a really big Osaka number, some good Korka numbers, and then a good number here in Fukuoka, 469 for the first show and 609 for the second. 324 so so they've had some numbers that have uh, have done better than that on both uh, daytime shows and evening show sets but unless i forgot something i think 484 is the best number they've done in this building since february of 2020 yeah when i saw the 484 that definitely raised my eyebrow as it was at least for what we've been used to over the last three years attendance and across fukuoka getting into that afternoon show we opened up with Gold class versus essentially veteran army. They, they might as well call it that. It is Yamato, BB Hulk, and Minorita versus Don Fuji, Ginky, Horiguchi, and Kagatora. It was a first flash from Hulk on Horiguchi. Match two, Dragon Daya versus Jackie Funky Kame. And it was Dragon Daya won with a kind of a, it, it was a Torbellino crucifix cutback. They kind of lost it, but it ended up being the pen. Uh, match three, Ultimo and Dragon Kid versus Asumu and Kanda went to a no contest with the Z Bratz interference. Match four, Masaki Mochizuki versus Ryoya Tanaka. Mochizuki puts down the rookie in a spirited effort in 839 with an ankle lock. Semi main event for the afternoon. Uh, it was Natural Vibes, KZ, Big Boss, Shimizu, Jason Lee, Strong Machine J versus Z Bratz, Shun Skywalker, Diamante, Hyo, uh, Kai and Ishin. The fall was Ishin over UT with a Kamada choke slam while staring down the Brave Gate champion. And the main event for the afternoon was D Courage, Madoka Kakuda, and Yuki Yoshioka versus Gold Class, Kota Minora, and B and Benke. Yoshioka gained the win over Minora with the frog splash. Fun show. I thought there was a some very good stuff here in particular Mochizuki versus Tanaka, which was the, I, I thought far and away the best Ryoya Tanaka outing thus far. And then Zebrats versus natural vibes, which I put on the spreadsheet four and a quarter stars for me. Yeah. The, I had these two by and large were the best things on this show. Uh, I thought this was Tanaka's best performance since his exhibition against Kakatora. He was weirdly good at that match, wasn't he? Yeah, and I think a lot of that was because he's getting crowd reactions and Mochi is more than willing to pop the top and start doing chop and kick battles, which, hey, that's a good thing. And also, like, the fact of you had a... It felt like a little bit of of, of a lack of cooperation a little bit early on in the match with it, I thought, ruled. I thought this really kind of rocks, especially when the finish came... Uh, Tanaka thought he could throw kicks against Masaki Mochizuki. He should have known better. He uh, immediately caught the leg, dropped down, got him in an ankle lot, and tacked him out. I, I was really, really kind of enthused with that, especially with the, the prospects of this rookie selection at Kobe World Case. There ha- he's going to jump the his seniors and get into this match, right? Well, yeah, so... We we don't know, and this this is the second dark match on the show. It's Hyo and Kai versus what's listed as a rookie selection team. And I would assume that is some combination of Kaito Nagano, Daiki Yanagiuchi, Ryo Fuda, and Ryoya Tanaka. And I don't know how they're going to decide that. I would love to know. And I would assume that Tanaka gets on that show. Yeah, it just makes a lot of sense with that. But I, can, I was... Can we talk real quick about sure. the... Uh, twisting lion salt that tanaka does and how first match he overshot it second match he under rotated and i don't know how much he weighs but i know every pound of him in this match came down as hard as it could on masaki mochizuki's abdomen it looked like a shoot lion salt the way he did it yeah it is one of the heaviest moves in all of wrestling because he's not like a huge guy but he gets so much momentum going i feel like and just yeah, crack it's, it. it's kind of an ongoing storyline now when I watch his matches of, okay, what's going to happen with that dive? Because he's he's yet to hit it in a way that looks good, but it's exciting to see what's going to happen. Right, yeah. And it, it's something that each time I see him, you hear the crowd connection. They, it's he, He's going to get every opportunity, I feel like. And, you know, having performances like this with uh, Mochizuki, this was the first time he threatened to... Uh, reach the spreadsheet for me yeah no this was good stuff i went three and a half on this i also i want to mention real quick because you talked about the chops mochizuki comes to the ring and wrestles the first part of the match wearing a shirt and they get into a chop battle and tanaka takes off the m3k tank top and chops his bare chest and now you know 
That takes guts. That That's a great little move right there. This was a really enjoyable match. If you haven't seen Tanaka wrestle yet, or if you haven't been impressed with Tanaka, I would go out of your way to watch this. This was really, really fun stuff. It's, you know, it's a young guy wrestling Masaki Mochizuki. It's a winning combination every time. Yeah, and then the 10-man the was just a whole chaos. lot of fun. Absolute chaos. chaos. It, it was absolute chaos, and it eventually ended into, like, a closing stretch where you had, like, Shimizu, like, just the the uh, the slam that he did on Hio, where he, the the one where they bounce off the ropes. I don't know if it's like a waist lock slam, and he just like picks you up in like mid motion, and then just goes timber slam slams you down. He that was vicious on this show. Case, I thought Ishin's finish on UT, and I forget what he calls that move, but it's kind of like the choke slam, angle slam looking thing. I yeah. mean, he almost put UT through the mat. Yeah, the Kamada style choke slam. I, whenever I see him do that, I'm like, that's actually a very smart way to get someone who's not very tall to pull off a choke slam and make it look good. Because it look, and, and a lot of that credit, I feel like I I know not to peel back the curtain too much. Ut went up high for it, and it made it look amazing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So now this was this was really good stuff here. It, it really struck me watching these shows and this match and the main event. You know. Like I said, we've only had this building in existence since May of 2019. So it's largely existed in COVID times. And because of that, there hasn't been any sort of legitimate crown brawling. And this match went all over the, the venue. And there is a visual of Shun Skywalker running down and then assaulting Strong Machine J with like a towel or a, a burlap sack. I don't know what it was that he had in his hand, but Skywalker goes on a full on sprint and just beats strong machine j with it in a way that was jarring it was shocking to look at yeah and that's why i think they're going to lean towards the brutality in the cage you can do stuff like that in the cage without the gimmicks you know like completely and and and, then and and then you have ishan and jason lee and i've been a vocal critic of ishan at times he seems dialed in right now you know him pinning ut by sitting on his chest shibata style and staring a hole through Jason Lee. All right, let me rub my hands together. I'm into that. That is exciting stuff right there. And you know, that's really all the Brave Gate build kind of needed. Like w- with where it is on the card and with Ishan and Jason, like you, you you just want to have just a little bit of like, okay, Ishan knows he's got a drop away. He has 18 days to do this. He's focused in here. And that's like a really kind of fun thing to see. Should I run through the evening show? Yeah, please. All right. So this well, actually, real, real quick, I just want to mention the D curd versus gold class match which is bizarre. Again, I'm not going to repeat all my talking points. The most interesting part of that match was Kakuta missed a hand of God lariat and coach Minora hit him with the jumbo knee. And there was a moment in time there where I thought the Kobe world Dreamgate match was going to have to be canceled because Kakuta was surely concussed. That spot looked brutal. And I don't think it was supposed to look as brutal as it did. Other than that, just an okay match. Yeah, it was... I was not a big fan of that main event, but the evening show, fun show. Like, I really had a good time with this. Uh, it opened up with what I wrote down, Case, as a hot little number. Yamato, Dragon Kid, Ginky Horiguchi versus Natural Vibes, KZ, Jason Lee, and UT. Jason gets the win with a maximum driver. Uh, Minorita versus Shimizu. Shimizu wins with the big boss press. Don Fuji and Kakatora versus Jackie Funky, Kamei, and Ryo Fuda. It was the half crab on Fuda. D Courage versus Z Brats, Kai, Hio, and Ishin. It was Kakuda over Hio with a Hand of God rolling Lariat. Semi main event, Gold Class, Kota Minora, Binkei, and BB Hulk versus M3K, Misaki Mochizuki, Zasumu Mochizuki, and Azushi Kanda. We had the M2K double count out committee and force there. And then in the main event, as we talked about to open the show, Ultimo Dragon and Strong Machine J versus Shun Monte, Shun Skywalker, and Diamante. After the match was restarted with special guest referee Dragon Kid, Ultimo won after a spinning DDT on Shun Skywalker by Dragon Kid getting tired of Shun, and then the La Magistral Cradle. You know what my biggest takeaway from the show was? What was that? I still have a bunch of Riafuda stock. Oh man, this kid is good. If he could only stay healthy, this kid is so good. I loved Fuji and Kagatora versus Kame and Fuda. I thought that match was awesome. And a lot of that was Kagatora doing. Dude, oh, I, I started to call you dude. I know that's I, odd that I did that. <laughs> but 
it's appropriate because Yasushi Kanda and Kagatora have been great this year. And I don't know how to handle that emotionally because that's just very abnormal. I was wondering if the rookies like left the uh, dojo not clean. Like it was that kind of theater. <laughs> Kagatora was like hustling in this match. He never does that. Yeah. Uh, did you notice how, uh, like just taking it to the singles match, did you notice the, uh, the Samoan drop that happened in that match? Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't ring a bell. Menorita came down hard on his side, <laughs> like okay, <laughs> l- like as if he did not like want. It, it was as if he was Ric Flair, but it was like from that height down. It it was wild. Uh, what do you think of the opener? I really loved it. I, I'm glad. I'm glad you also recognize this was quote a hot little number because it was. Uh, you know, I I am one of Genki Horiguchi's biggest fans of all time, but I recognize Genki as well past his prime. And hot, hot diggity. This was a nice little Genki Horiguchi match. Yeah, he, him and Jason in that closing stretch and throughout of it. And then you had a, I, I find it so fascinating, like UT's role in this unit, just like taking the absolute heat for like what felt like the, until the first five minute call, it felt like. Yeah, yeah, completely. And, and, and then like even the, I felt like that they really played up the double ring out committee smart especially considering what's what was going to happen in the main event i just thought that this was a really solid uh across fukuoka show like uh, across the now four years in the building i i come away with this one just as excited as i was in april like this building might be turning its corner it's certainly a hot crowd you know when when you have a guy like tanaka getting reactions and when they're as hot as they are for the main event Okay, you know I'm excited. I, I I can I can look forward to the next time they're in town, and I'm I'm sure that's in August. Let me look at the schedule real quick to see when they're back, because now I'm curious if they're doing King of Gate here or not. Um, and it doesn't look like it. I don't see. Okay, we don't have the full August schedule, so I'm I'm assuming they'll be back in August. And I have no reason to dread it anymore. You know, this is a building that has not always been the friendliest to us, but I I like the spot that they're in in Fukuoka right now. Yeah, it, it's something that I it, I have such like an emotional connection to across uh, or not not to across to Hakata Star Lanes, and there's nothing that could really kind of replace that. But it, it's forging its own identity, and I feel like that's like a far place from where it was at in 2019. Where I was like, oh, this looks like a much smaller Corkin. Yes, very much so. I'm all, Genki Horiguchi just tweeted that i think they'll be back in august nice the translation's a little uh, translation's a little confusing but i but i believe they're back there in august that would make sense with how they run this building yeah no it's it's an every other month building but case something we wanted to do with this because we're now with the conclusion of across fukuoka we are full steam ahead to kobe pro wrestling festival 2023 this what this next segment was kind of your idea here the spot check how are we going to spot check these guys yeah kobe world spot check i'm gonna go through all of the full-time dragon gate wrestlers or i guess rather the usual dragon gate wrestlers i'm essentially not counting kano and taro nohashi but all of the guys that are on this year's kobe world card and we're going to look at where they were last year for ultimo 35th and kobe world pro wrestling festival and you tell me are they in a better spot a worse spot, or are they the same? Okay? All right, let's do it. All right, some of these will be pretty quick. Uh, some of these, I think, longer explanations will be needed. But let's start with the guy that we've spent a lot of this podcast talking about, a guy in the main event that was in a very important spot last year, Ultimo Dragon. Better, worse, or the same? I think just for the fact that there's not the weight of an entire show around his neck, better. I completely agree. You know, last year, he obviously was booked against Sato, in a match that I think you and I cared about and nobody else did. And then that turned into a DQ, luckily, because Ata and Nozawa ran in and saved what was a sad old man wrestling match up to that point, turned it into a tag match. Do you remember all of the participants in Ultimo Dragon's match on night two of Kobe World last year? I do because I have the cards pulled up in front of me, but but for our listeners, can you go through that? Yes, it was Ultimo Dragon, El Hijo Del Santo, and the Great Sasuke, Versus Nozawa, Ata, in a name that blew my head off when I read this. Super crazy. I completely forgot Super Crazy was on the show last year. 
Yeah, and I, I think he was just randomly like brawling on the night before to set that up. Too. Yeah, I'm sure he was a second, but I, I who who knows? So, you know, I, I, we'll talk attendance later because we'll have Jay on in two weeks to preview this show. Last year, they did under 2,000 for the Ultimo show, and they did just over 2,000 for Yoshioka versus Minora. They did 3,500 for the Yoshino retirement show. It feels like they have to do 3,500 or over this year. And if they don't, do we sort of have to point the finger at Ultimo just a little bit? For me, my barrier is a little bit lower. I think 3,000. And okay. uh, and if it's lower, then uh, I think the whole entire car construction deserves criticism. Okay, I think that's fair. Uh, next on the list, Strong Machine J, better or worse or the same? Better. Better. Yep, last year he was in a opening Natural Vibes versus Gold Class Tag Team match on the first night, and then a Triangle Gate match which M- with M3K and High End on the second night, which was notable because that was really the, the Strong Machine J coming out party because he and Mochizuki Jr. got the shine in the last bit of that match. And I wrote in my my preview last year, I said, you know, Dragon Gate needs to be really careful do not let mochizuki jr and strong machine j have a big sequence with with sequence with one another neither of them are ready and they showed me how wrong i was they killed it last year really gave jay some momentum and now you know he's in the main event it is a featured part of the main event so i think he absolutely has to be looked at as being in a better position oh no absolutely so i mean if you're on an opener and you're now in the main event like the answer is automatic Shun Skywalker, better or worse, the same? Slightly better, just because he did have that Twin Gate semi-main event, but the next night he was in that opener. Yeah, I've got him marked as the same, but I, I'm not going to fight you there. You know, obviously last year's Twin Gate match, one of the best matches in company history, Shun and Diamante versus Jason Lee and Jackie Funky Kamei, with Shun really just being an otherworldly worker in that match. I mean, it showed why I consider him to be a top five guy, top 10 guy, if you really want to be stingy with it. But I think anybody with a pulse, anybody with a clue looks at a performance like that and realizes that Shun Skywalker is one of the most talented guys in all of the industry right now. His partner in the twin gate match last year, his opponent this year, Diamante better, worse the same. Again, better. I mean, uh, we're both with the working idea that Diamante is losing this match, but will be the focal point. The, the, there's, again, automatic better. Automatic better. He's obviously, he was in a big match last year, semi-main event, twin gate match. But that was a match built around Jackie Funky Kamei and continuing a Shun Skywalker versus Jason Lee story. Diamante was wonderful in it. He was terrific. It, you know, again, he did quite well on my SFM 50. I think I had him as the 15th best wrestler in the world last year, but he was the fourth most important guy in that match. We're looking at a very realistic scenario here, Mike, where Diamante closes this show with a baby face turn and a metaphorical jetpack being strapped to him by the time we say goodbye to Kobe and move to Tokyo the next week. Diamante unequivocally was in a good position last year in a better position this year. Right. I think that's the way you have to think of it. Like, yeah, there's, there's, I, there's a lot of that where, you know, guys are, guys are doing better, but they weren't necessarily suffering last year. I think one of those guys is dragon kid. I have him uh, doing better last year. He was uh, in a match. It, well, do you remember, or do you have the cards pulled up still? Yeah. This was his uh, 25th anniversary match. Yes, Dragon Kid and Masato Tanaka versus BB Hulk and Yamato. Another one of those things with a gun to my head. I would not have remembered that match. So he does that night one. Night two, he's a part of the Benkei and Yamato high-end at Triangle Gate Challenger uh, team. This year's in the main event. To me, that is a, a better spot. It is better, but it's a different kind of better because he's really there as a utility player, whereas last year it was an anniversary match. Yeah, but, you know, I yes, you're exactly right. And he wasn't, he was in the Triangle Gate match. There wasn't a story with him in the Triangle Gate match. Like I said, I think he could be one of the last two guys in the cage this year, and that elevates him. Next guy on the list, I think one that you and I can absolutely agree on, even though we've been pretty much locked up so far. I don't expect too many disagreements, but Madoka Kakuta. Worse because he's not in a match with the bodyguard. Of course, better. <laughs> of course. This, this is the biggest leap and especially a positive leap at that. There's one guy that I think really fell off a cliff, but 
this is the biggest leap in a positive direction. Last year, it was Ben K, Madoka Kakuta, and Takashi Yoshida versus Gurken Mask, Kanichiro Rai, and the Bodyguard on night one. And then Best Don- trio. Best trio. <laughs> yeah. trio no, no argument for me. <laughs> they would be absolutely. I know we've I know the website's been running a lot of Takara retrospective tenure of the shutdown, but you look at that trio case and you know one, I wonder who you're talking to, and two, that, that team's going all the way. No argument from me. So that's night one. Night two, it's Don Fuji and Dragon Daya versus Madoka Kakuta and Takashi Yoshida. And Dragon Daya pins Madoka Kakuta in six minutes. He is in two utterly meaningless matches. Yes, they are paying off the angle for Fuji and Daya there at the expense of Madoka Kakuta. Two utterly meaningless matches. You and I questioning what his future would look like. Does he need to go heal? Will he ever be relevant again? A month later, he links up with D-Courage. He is now the Open the Dreamgate champion. And going into Fukuoka, I would have said the hottest act in the company. Yep, no total agreement there. Yuki Oshioka, better or worse the same? Slightly worse, if only because his match is no longer in the main event. Interesting. I think he's in a better spot because he isn't dealing with cancerous 2022 Coach Minora being attached to his hip. Yeah, that is true. The, 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 there is no sniffing of a debacle on this card. Like, that alone, we, we should be a lot higher on this card just for the fact that we don't have another Wedge and Kota Minora storyline. Put a pin in that. Before we go, I want to talk about that. That's, it's a point I thought of this week. I've got some numbers that I want to share. Let's, let's get through this because we still got a lot of names to go. But look, Yoshioka last year, him versus Kai, just that alone— I think would have been a really triumphant victory. Now we don't have to go back and have that conversation because Yoshioka's Dreamgate run was so solid. He beat all the former Dreamgate champions, lost to Skywalker, crushed it. This year he's been a lost post uh, in D Courage, but they've they figured out a way at least up through the match announcement to to heat him back up and to do him versus Kakuta. I think he's in a better spot, like I said, just because he's not wrestling Kota Minora. KZ, uh, better or worse the same better i maybe like he is where we get into like okay he is a champion coming into this but you look at last year and he was a championship match uh uh did you have this year's card in front of you uh where is the triangle gate on the lineup the triangle gate match on 2022 kobe world is going to be uh, third from the top it is after yamato versus Horomu and before the open the dream gate championship match I kind of think he's in the same position. Yes, I, I would I would co-sign that as I just lost track of what... Well, he was in two Triangle Gate matches last year, right? So, no, because there was the M3K title win at Ultimo 35. Okay, so he did... Remind me, because I just lost that card. Here Se- it is. Go, second, oh, go ahead. Second match, Natural Vise versus Gold Class. That was the first show. That was the Ultimo show. And then, yeah, night, two, and then, and then night two, he was in the Triangle Gate match. Okay, he's in the same spot as last year. Yeah, uh, total agreement there. Uh, my answer is the same as this. Big Boss Shimizu, uh, he's in a same. Triangle Gate match this year. He was in a Triangle Gate match last year. He is in the same spot. That's that's not a bad thing. You know, th- these are guys that are firmly upper mid carters. Dragon Gate needs more of those guys. Uh, nothing wrong with that. What about Jackie Funky Kame? I think you have to say worse spot, if only for that he was a semi-main eventer, and this time he's not. Yes. Right? Uh, it's yeah. he's, he's in a worse spot, but that's not an indictment on him. It's not even really an indictment on the company. He no. was just in a giant match last year, and he's in a sort of big match this year. Yeah, I mean, he still has a belt around the weekend. Like, it's slightly worse. What about Kota Minora? Worse, but we feel much better about it. it okay, that's interesting. Yeah, this is this is the uh, the prime example of you and I's brains working in, in slightly different ways. Because last year, night one, it's Big Boss Shimizu, KZ, and Strong Machine J versus Minora, Minorita, and Doi. And then obviously night two, it's him versus Yoshioka. And even when you look at the card this year, he's once again teaming with Minorita and Doi. Minorita still the most interesting uh, guy in that trio. Doi is having one hell of a 2023, mainly outside of Dragon Gate. But Minora, being in a match this high on the card, in not being, as I used earlier, the word cancerous, is um he is in a better position this year. 
okay, I see your your philosophy behind that. I still think, you know, you're main eventing and you're not main eventing anymore. But your logic there is sound. I can't. But he should really... he shouldn't have main evented last year. Right. It was but a disservice I mean... to all of us. But we play the cards we're dealt, right? Oh, fair enough. I yeah, I I I see where you're coming from there. What about Minorita, his partner? You know, Minorita's. I think. I uh, gosh, I have to remember what he did last year. So he was in that six man against Natural right. Rise, and then night two, it was him and Doi versus Shuji Kondo and Toro Washi in a match that no one remembers. I have to say better because he's in a title match. Yep. Yeah, completely. You know, last year he worked his ass off to save Gold Class. Ben K come again really helped things, but the the act. Uh, by and large, was kept alive by Menorita. This year, he gets rewarded for that hard work. He's in a title match. Good stuff there. What about Naruki Doi? Well, like, he, he's the rare case that you go freelance. I have to say he's in a better position because he's in a title match. Completely agree. You'll notice a trend here. A lot of guys in a better spot than they were last year. Uh, like Mike said, the build to this year's show has been a little different in the way they've timed it. That is why I want to do this exercise. I think a lot of guys are in better positions than they were last year. Yamato, for me, being one of them. Like I said, you know, team with BB Hulk against Dragon Kid and Masato Tanaka, and then represented high end in an open the triangle gate match. And representing high end in an open the triangle gate match is never a good place to be. This year, he's wrestling Hiromu Takahashi. He's done quite well for himself. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that this is a place where you go card positioning. I think this is something that this storyline and especially like the fact of how he's been portraying himself in this storyline in of itself makes it in a much better position. Susumu Mochizuki and the twin gate match this year was in two triangle gate matches last year. Better, worse, the same. I kind of have to say same. Yep. Yep. Title matches. He's look, this makes sense. Look at the guys yeah. that are the same so far. It's Shun Skywalker and it's Susumu Mochizuki and KZ and Big Boss Shimizu. Those guys are always the same. Yeah, I, I know you always say Tim Duncan. You, you, you know who is Susumu Mochizuki as a comedian? I'm fascinated to hear this. Who's that? Joe Para. I thought you were going to say Brian Regan. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm, I'm thinking about uh, Joe Para talks to you, and he talks about how much he waters down his coffee as a teacher because he wants to have the exact same equal caffeine level throughout the day. Susumu's very even person. Who's the who's the Dragon Gate equivalent of Brian Regan? Gosh. <laughs> right? Uh, is it Naruki Doi? It might be Naruki Doi. They, might be he's, Doi. The, he's the only one coming to mind here. Fascinated by Regan making all those money from the Mormons that he'll just tour Mormon country for a month every year and just rake in cash. Fascinated uh, by that. I, I I mean, it's kind of a brilliant business. Oh, like, it's awesome. I, he deserves it too. He's I you know. He's a very funny man. What about Yasushi Kanda? Better or worse, the same. Last year, he's not on the Ultimo show. Second night, it's Genki Horiguchi, Ryo Saito, and Yasushi Kanda versus Matsuyama, Stalker Ijikawa, and Sachi Hoko Boy. This year, he's in an open the Twin Gate match and is having arguably the best year of his career. Better or worse, the same, Mike. Oh, I don't know. I liked seeing that pseudo uh, do fix or trio last year. Of course, better. He's having uh, he's having a career year. Yeah. Uh, other than Madoka Kakuta, he might be the single biggest glow up this year. Yeah, I, and I don't think there's much argument one can make otherwise. Yep. What about BB Hulk as opponent? You know, last year, like I said, it was Yama Hulk versus Dragon Kid and Masato Tanaka, and then he worked that opening match on the second night that was Zebrats versus the Kung Fu Masters. Better. Yep, I, I think he's working really well in gold class. You know, I, I'm yep. I'm surprised at how much I'm still enjoying that act. Yeah, no, it's something that I think that, like, you had him in, like, just his position in Z Bratz was getting a little onerous, and just him being in gold class puts him in a better position. Ben K, his partner, better or worse the same? Oh, much better, I would say. We're, we were at, you know, crisis point with Ben K last year. Last year at World, I really want to paint this picture. Kaisuke Akuda had just been fired from the company, but this is before Chicky Chicky Ben K. This is dead in the water, high end Ben K, going nowhere fast, not relevant, not over, nothing going on for him. He just happened to be in a Triangle Gate match this year. Look, like I've said, I I don't love this Twin Gate match on paper. I I think it's weird the way it was set up with. Ben and Hulk just kind of assuming that number one contendership position. I don't love the way they got to it, 
Well, but Finn been... doesn't shut up. You have to like it, acquiesce yes. and say, "Yeah, fine, I'll, I'll have your match with you." Fine, okay. I mean, the guy like by himself was longer than the mat than, than the pre-show introductions at Hakata. Yes, very, very much so. So I, he's in a much better position. Uh, I had Konamami Shikawa on the list. For me, he's the same because he he's wrestling an X this year. He wrestled an X last year in KG Muto. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you have to call him same. Don Fuji, better or worse, the same. I mean. What did he make the shows last year? I don't think he made the shows. I think he's better. So night one, it was Don Fuji wrestling. Uh, oh, hold on, where'd that match go? It was Fuji and oh, it, it was Kondo it, it, Tora's it, it, 20th yeah, thank, anniversary. Thank yes, it yeah. was Fuji, Shuji Kondo, and Toru Washi against Jin Shinzaki, Kagatora, and Taro Nohashi. And then the second night, like I said, it was Fuji and Daya pinning Kakuta in six minutes. So it's still a Legends match, still an offer match, but Mochi Fuji versus Kano and Kondo sounds much better on paper than anything he did last year. So he's in a better spot as well. Yeah, uh, it's yeah, it's Kagator's 20th anniversary, but you look at everyone else in that match, and Don Fuji is just there because he was a member of Crazy Max. What about Masaki Mochizuki, as partner? I will go first. I think he's in a little bit of a worse spot. Last year, he had the two Triangle Gate matches that were really built around him and and his son, and M3K. through It's a little bit like the Jackie Funky Kamei situation. He hasn't done anything wrong. I don't think he's been butchered, but he felt a little bit more important on last year's shows. Yeah, and it's just solely because Junior's hurt. Like, I imagine that maybe it was going to be the Mochizukis versus Kondo and Kano, maybe, and Fuji. Yeah, or and... another M3K versus M3K match. I, you know, Junior comes back on that Booyadin show the next week. And maybe he's the guy that wrestles Stalker. I don't know. I'm so bummed Junior's not on this show. Yeah, uh, yeah, it, it, it's a bummer on it, but you can't really blame Mochizuki for his position here. It, it, it It's a worse, but it's just kind of like that's them to the breaks. What about Shuji Kondo? I, it, in a lot of ways, I think Kondo's kind of the exact same because you have... He was he he did a Aganiso match against Doi and Rita, and then he was a part of the six man tag. I I mean, th this is like the weird thing. Like, how is like Don Fuji doing a little better, but Kondo isn't? Well, I think Kondo is doing better because Kondo and Kano feel like a real thing right now. I that's, want this tag team to drag it full time. That that that's a very good point. I'm with you on that. Here's what we might disagree on: Jason Lee, better, or worse, the same. I think better if only because he's a singles champion. Okay. All right. I, I've got about the same, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to drive to Texas and strangle you over it. Don't worry. I, yeah. think he's the I think he's in the same position. You know, last year, better spot on the card, a little bit more of an important match, but this is a really important match for him this year against Ishan. It's going to set the tone for the show. If Jason Lee versus Ishan delivers in a real honest barn burner way, now we've got 2019 vibes. Now we've got that KZ versus Skywalker match where that happens on, you know, match three or whatever. We go, oh, what what else is going to happen on this show? If that's the working standard, where do we go from here? KZ versus, or I'm sorry, not KZ, but Jason Lee versus Ishan, uh, an immensely important match just for the sake of the show. And that brings us to all caps Ishan. Oh, much better, much better. I mean, it, the, this was still kind of in his wilderness wandering phase before they really kickstarted the fall half of the year with the uh, Ihashi versus Mochizuki's feud. Completely. You know, last year he was in the pre-show battle Royal the first night, uh, which that winner got a brave gate match. And then night two, uh, him and Gurkin mask and problem dragon and UT versus Kagatora, Arakan punch Tom Naga and Rhea Fuda. Now he's a character. He's got a gimmick. He's got momentum going into this match. Uh, all good things for Ishin, not the case for dragon Daya. As I look at this show, a lot of great matches here. A lot of guys elevated as this whole exercise has been about. Dragon Daya, sort of the lost guy on this show. Yeah, and this is a worse, but not like a them's the breaks worse. This is like, oh, you you look at how the, this is why I say if it doesn't break 3000, like the conversation is the car construction here because Daya, one of the most over people on the roster in a what really looks like, hey, uh, we got a date on Eita and Taru Nahashi. Who else can we put in this match to make it make sense? I love this match on paper. I will say oh, that it's fun. it is. Yeah, it's uh, Dragon Daya, Lastray, and Eita 
versus Kagatora, Yuti, and Taro Nohashi. That's a lot of a lot of things I like in one match. Right. Yeah. But but it but it still is like no, a match of zero importance whatsoever. Completely. And last year he was in a Brave Gate match. Night one lost the belt to Hyo. And then night two was in that tag with Don Fuji. A few more names on the list here. These will go by quick. Ata, better or worse or the same? Last year worse. was the uh, <laughs> the end of Paris Del Mal de Japon, which say what you will about that. For people that actually watch the promotion, they know that Paros in the ring were a net positive. Uh, and uh, even if the Santo six man was a disaster, at least it was important. This year is in the opening match. Yeah, worse. Like, I, worse, worse, worse. Hey, this is the this is the life you decided to leave. So you're in the opener. Yep. I've got Kagatora the same. I've got UT at the same. Any disagreements there? No. I, I actually I would say Kagatora worse because he's not having an anniversary match, but that's really just <laughs> yeah, that's, that's out of his control. <laughs> yeah. He, 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 yeah, he can't control when he was born. But yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm gonna combine these next two names. Because I think they're both both worse off, and I think they're the biggest drop offs from year to year, and that is Kai and Hyo. Yeah, I mean they one of them walked into this in a Kobe World main event, and the other became won his first singles championship, and now they are in the second pre show match against a rookie team. It's it's bizarre, you know. I, it, it just goes to show, and I was as I was putting together that Ultimo stuff earlier. I realized I was like, oh, that's right. Hyo's in the main event of that first Toriumon reunion show as a member of R.E.D. He's been a heel for three and a half years now. And for as much as I love Zebrats, historically, I think they're one of the best heel units they've ever had. So many good matches, memorable angles, this, that, the other thing. Kai and Hyo as heels seem to have hit the end of the line. And this is a representation of, you know, They've been in a bunch of six-man main events this year when Ishin was out and Diamante was hurt, and obviously uh, SB Kento was in Mexico. So it was just, you know, Shun and Hyo and Kai. They wrestled a lot of, of main events, and it didn't feel like Kai or Hyo ever gained momentum out of that. So I could argue and say, well, you know, this pre-show match is beneath them, but where on the card do they go? You know, Ishin has momentum, Shun has momentum, Diamante has momentum. I mean, you could throw these guys against Toro, Awashi, and X, but, you know, who gives a shit? That's the same thing, just not on the pre-show. Right, yeah. And it's one of those things, I mean, Hio now is the longest tenured heel on the roster, case. Yeah, I mean, he has to be in the running, and you would know better than me, but he has to be in the running for one of the longest tenured heels ever. Uh, I mean, Doi had a really long run. Uh. And, and, and well, then you well, get what, what's what's Doi's longest so blood generation through muscle outlaws probably. Yeah, yeah, and and then you could also say like Mad Blanky, like Mad Blanky transforming, and then the three years into and, and then a year into Berserk as well. So and I mean, like that's a, he he is he is in Berserk for pretty long. You're right. I yeah. kind of forgot that. Yeah. So it, it it it's something that you look at these two guys and. Whenever, uh, other than like the main event where you are already probably having that face turn, these are the two guys you look at with like big blinking lights and go like, what, how long can you keep of this with Hyo? Though, I don't know how Hyo now works as a face. Well, it's going to have to happen. I think right, he's going to, yeah. I think he's going to have to get absolutely throttled by Shun Skywalker. Because I think there's a lot of legs left as Shun leading Zebrats or leading some sort of heel unit. Uh, I think there's a, an interesting place for Shun and Yoshioka together as top heels. I think he just has to get his ass kicked unmercilessly for him to be able to work his baby face again. I mean, mercilessly and then probably go away for a little bit. Hmm. I would be wary of sending him to Mexico. Yeah, yeah, but, 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 but you, you see my point, though. I do, I do. Yeah. Uh, last guys here, tell me if you disagree. Sachi Boy, the same. Takashi Yoshida, the same. Problem Dragon, the same. Genki Horiguchi, the same. Punch Tamanaga, the same. And Ho Ho Loon, the same. Any any stark uh, arguments you want to make for those guys? I don't know how one in good faith could. I yes. mean, th th this is something where, like, this is having two of these matches. This is like, hey, we left some of y'all off last year. Well, we're not doing so that again. So just to recap, and this is why I think this is relevant, you know, last year's Kobe World was a clusterfuck. The card came together at the last minute, at least publicly. 
And now you've got the show this year where just guys in better off positions, forget, you know, KZ and Shun and Jason, guys that I have marked as the same. Ultimo Dragon, Strong Machine J, Diamante, Dragon Kid, Madoka Kakuta, Yuki Yoshioka, Coach Minora, Minorita, Naruki Doi, Yamato, Yasushi Kanda, Binke, Don Fuji, Shuji Kondo, Ishin, uh, all of those guys. I think are in better spots this year and Ben K. I don't think I mentioned him. All of those guys are in better spots this year than they were last year. And if we go to the tail of the tape, essentially as to why that might be Mike, we didn't have a Kobe world card until like two weeks before world last year, July 10th is when we got match listings for the right. Osmo Dragon 35th anniversary show. I went back and looked this up. That show takes place on July 31st. July 10th, we get half of the matches announced. And then July 23rd, the Triangle Gate matches announced. And then July 24th, heading out of that Kobe Sambo Hall show with the three-way between Kondo and Yoshioka and Minora. July 24th, one week before the show, is when we had the full card announced. And then Kobe World the day after, we don't get that until the morning of. They had nothing booked for that. They had guys appearing, but they had nothing booked for that show until the day of, and that card sucked on paper. Yeah, it's something where, as much as we can say, and we'll be able to do this uh, after July 1st, we can at least say, like, they presented everything at least that if I were to say, if I were to put my mind or into the body of a native Dragon Gate fan, it's a lot easier for me to make my purchase decision here now versus, well, uh, got to see what's going to happen out of this three-way. I mean, imagine if you were someone who was just a huge Shuji Kondo fan last year. And you're like, hey, yeah. you know, Kondo, Kondo has a claim there. And you're like, I... And especially with how things were and how like the comedy was, it's like, I don't know if I'm going to make go two days in Kobe for this, but uh, Sushi Kondo makes it. I'm going to go. You didn't, you didn't really give them an opportunity to make that decision. Whereas this year, l l like, yes, it's fast re report. It's fast oncoming case, but we're still 17 days out as of the time of recording. So, you know, a month out, we had the main event announced and, you know, very quickly matches started to come together this year. Last year, just to, to sort of re go over this timeline, June 2nd, the Tori Mon show, that's when Santo was announced that he is going to appear. No word until June 27th when it's announced that Jinsei, Jinsei Shinzaki, Toru Nohashi, and the bodyguard are going to appear. And then July 3rd, is when Masato Tanaka gets booked. It's not until that core can show on July 7th that there's anything anything at all going on it, it is a complete and utter disaster uh last year just in terms of putting this card together it was awkward and uncomfortable uh for us to do previews of voices of wrestling we didn't know what was going to happen we didn't know what anything was going to be this year three weeks out we got the full card the card looks great we'll do more coverage of it next week and then two weeks from now uh fingers crossed we'll have jay on that is the plan at least as of now if something changes we will let you know but I'm very excited for this show. You know, weird Dreamgate build, uh, uninspired Twingate build aside, there is no reason this show should absolutely kick ass. Yeah, no, and that will be coming to us on July 2nd. There will be a lot of coverage, both on Open the Voice Gate and on VoicesOfWrestling.com as we get closer to Kobe World 2023. But case there's still are shows that are happening. They're just not on the network, and they are doing their semi-annual trip to Okinawa this weekend for Lek Fuo Run Mask presents Minso Ray Gate in Okinawa. Uh, should I just go through the, the, the two cards? And we think, we, we are going to expect that, that we will be getting digest forms of these shows on YouTube, which for some of these matches, I feel like they kind of need to get them on YouTube to build up the show. Uh, yeah, run through the cards real quick. All right, so on the 17th, this is, both of these shows are in Okinawa. We open up with uh, Natural Vibes, KZ, Strong, Machine J, and Big Boss Shimizu versus Jason Lee, UT, and Jackie Funky Kame. Natural Vibes explodes. Match to Masaki Mochizuki and freelancer Drake Morimatsu versus Problem Dragon and representing Ryuku Dragon Pro Wrestling, uh, Mi Hibiscus. Match three, Gold Class, Entire Compliment. 
going up against Yamato, Ginki Horiguchi, Kagatora, and Ryu Fuda is the rookie that makes the trip here. Susumu Mochizuki and Azushi Kanda versus Dragon Kid and Teal and Shisa. And then the main event, the Luck for Run Masks prize. Six-man tag team match. It is D Courage versus Z Brats, Shun Skywalker, Kai, and Hio. Case, you see they were teaming together so much at the early part of the year, not only because of injury, but to prepare themselves to potentially win the Lek Fua Run Mask Prize. I'll take your word for it. I have no, yeah. I have no argument against that claim. I mean, it, uh, the the show's not on the network. We don't know what what, what the build of this is. Like, like for all we know, that they're just going to show up with a giant like sign that they're going to get a a year supply of bath w- of toilet wipes. That's what we're going to custom <laughs> to with these people. Uh, l- l- let's talk about uh, this show on the 18th. This is the one where there's some stuff here that is a lot of Kobe Pro Wrestling Festival build. We open with Yamato teaming with Double Dragons versus Natural Vibes KZ, Jason Lee, and UT. Singles match, Problem Dragon versus Kai. Okay. Uh, match three, Ginki Horiguchi's teaming with Drake Morimatsu versus Kagatora and Ryukyu Dragon Pro Wrestling's Go Samaru. Uh, match four, we have Benkei, BB Hulk, and Ryu Fuda versus Masaki Mochizuki, Susumu Mochizuki, and Zushi Kanda. Getting a little bit of Twin Gate build there. Right there. Semi main event, Strong Machine J and Ultra Soki representing Ryukyu Dragon Pro Wrestling versus Shun Skywalker and Hio. And then another Lek Fua Run Mask Prize six man tag team match. Dream and Triangle Gate skirmish in Osaka case. Matoka Kakuda teams with Big Boss Shimizu and Jackie Funky Kame versus Yuki Yoshioka, Kota Minora, and Minorita. So we are getting. Yoshioka and Kakuda on opposite sides in a match. It just so happens that's going to happen in Okinawa and not on the Dragon Gate Network. Yeah, great match. I don't, I don't know why they didn't do it in Fukuoka, but a a great match. I love that Fuda's on these shows, and hopefully, uh, both the Fuda matches and obviously those main events make YouTube. Yeah, and they're a little bit more judicious about the Riku Dragon in this. Yeah, you know, l- l- like I still want to see my main man. Sherry Joe, but I get it with that. But we'll we'll see when these shows end up on YouTube. I I feel like that they are very prompt with the YouTube digest, but it could be something with these kind of shows that they're not traveling with the uh Gaura production for the network that who knows it how long this could take to get uploaded, you know? Yeah, we we will see. We will see, but Case, uh, that's all I have for my rundown for the show. Do you have anything else you want to hit on before we got out of here? I'm out of topics. All right, so that's going to do it for this week on Open the Voice Gate. We'll be back with you next week as we are further on the road to Kobe World. Case, we're inching there, slowly but surely. Before we know it, it will be July 2nd. It will be Kobe Pro Wrestling Festival from Kobe World Cannon Hall. You can follow us on Twitter at Open Voice Gate. Cases at underscore in your case. I'm at Fuji Heya. While you're at it, go to your podcast catcher of choice. Hopefully it's Apple iTunes or Google Podcasts, Spotify, wherever it is. Rate and review Open the Voice Gates. The best way for people to f- discover the show. That's going to do it. We'll be back with you next week. Take care, everyone. Hey, everybody. My name is Jesse Collings, and I want to tell you all about my show, The Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast, here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. On The Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast, we do a thorough analysis on the biggest issues and trends within the pro wrestling industry. We talk a lot about pro wrestling media, we talk a lot about fan culture and wrestling's place within general pop culture, and we talk about the broader influences that are shaping the way we discuss and analyze the pro wrestling industry. We've had some of the brightest minds in the pro wrestling intelligentsia on the show, including WrestleNomics host Brandon Thurston, both Rich Krejci and Joe Lanza from the Flagship Wrestling Podcast, Trevor Dame from the Through the Years Podcast, and a whole lot more. This isn't a show for hot takes. It's not a show recapping the latest episode of television. This is a show focusing on the biggest topics in pro wrestling and doing a deep dive on the real stories behind the surface level analysis you might find elsewhere. The Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts, and we'd really appreciate it if you gave us a try. Thanks.
Hello everyone, my name is Taylor. And I'm Kelly. And we are the co-hosts of Jumping Bomb Audio, the podcast all about Joshi Pro Wrestling here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. Every other Monday, we are with you talking about the biggest news in Joshi, along with show reviews, previews, and much, much more. So if you're new to Joshi or you've been a longtime fan, this is the show for you. We've got something for everyone here. So check us out, Jumping Bomb Audio.